this application uh, explores the beta binomial conjugacy relationship. So um, this book is largely focused on theoretical probability. Uh, we don't delve too much into applied statistics, but we, we do here because it's a interesting result of, of the beta distribution. Um, and this is a this is a really sort of first step into Bayesian statistics. So recall, and of course you can go back and read um, sort of the chapter and the discussion on this for a more f thorough discussion. Um, but it, essentially, we have some. In this case, we have some parameter, some some sorry, we have some random variable that's binomial uh, with a fixed number of trials n and an unknown parameter p. So you know you can think of I don't know. Um, number of people that will pass, or where x is like a number of people that will pass a test, you have n people and each person has some probability p of passing the test, and, and maybe you don't know p, the whole point of this is you don't know p, um, and in general like in, in this sort of book, in this probability contest, we've been working where we know the random variable, we know the parameters, and we try to like make guesses about the these outcomes, like we, we know that something is Poisson 5, what's the probability of this occurrence? Um, in applied statistics, what we're doing here is we maybe know the outcomes, like we know how many people pass the test, we, we observe the data, but we don't un know the parameters. So here we don't know, you know, we don't know P in the, in the binomial example. Um, so that's sort of the idea with applied statistics. Um, we're kind of changing the direction. And in this case, what happens is we put a prior, what's called a prior on that unknown parameter. So here we don't know the parameter P and we put a beta prior on it. Um, the beta prior is a, a pretty good choice for a couple of regions, reasons, again, that we mentioned. Chief among them is that the beta is bounded between 0 and 1. So probability must, between, must be bounded between 0 and 1. The beta is, is a good choice. Okay. So in this, in this uh, application, we're going to sort of do examples of this beta binomial conjugacy, conjugacy. And you can see here I have a couple of sliders. Let's talk about what these sliders are. This alpha slider basically determines the alpha parameter of the beta prior. And the beta, this beta slider, don't don't mix up like this beta, I'm sorry, don't mix up this beta and this beta. This beta is just, we're saying we have a, a, a beta distribution that is beta with an alpha parameter a and a beta parameter b so it's just it's, just, it's like like just like a normal distribution is normal mu sigma squared this distribution is beta alpha beta i know it can be kind of confusing but think of these are the, these are the parameters so don't get don't get tripped up by that um okay and we're going to say these these values can go from zero to uh, from one to ten so um the prior this is where we just the prior right we just the prior distribution on p recall that for high values of if alpha is high relative to beta um, or, you know, A is high relative to B, then the mean of the beta distribution is larger. So if, if alpha was 10 here, we'd have like a, a mean that's, you know, much higher than if, than if beta was 10. Okay. These next two uh, sliders actually discuss or like give us the, the data that we observe. So the, this is the prior distribution of P, and this is once we actually run the experiment, we get to set like what we observe. So here we're you know we're interested in p, which again we're thinking of we thought of a simple example of students passing tests. Um, here we set n equal to fifty, so we have fifty students, and we say twenty five passed the test. So this kind of seems like a sort of a weird setup for now, but we're actually going to hit go in a second and think about what this means. Um, so yeah, let's just go for it. Let's hit go. Takes a little second to run. Okay, so now this, it, it gives us two plots, and this kind of helps us to understand what's going on. This left plot is the prior distribution of p, and like I said, here here's the beta distribution. Ooh, can't highlight that. Here's the beta distribution, and it has the first parameter is this value, this alpha value. The second parameter is this beta value, and we've seen that a beta one one is also the same as a uniform zero one distribution. So this is just you know a bunch of random draws from a beta 1, 1 distribution and it, it, it you know it's uniform it's it's random so it's a little bit not uniform but it, it, analytically it is uniform and we just kind of see that here we can see that if we increase alpha like i mentioned earlier so let's say alpha is 4 now this becomes a more skewed distribution it clumps up sort of more near 1 right you can see that bound goes from 0 to 1 cuz it is a beta um, but but this is just saying our our guess for p right this is so this is a case let's say i go back to 1 and 1 Here's a case where we don't know anything about p. Could be anywhere from 0 to 1, we're not sure. Here's maybe a case where we think p is pretty high, right? So it's random, but it's, it's clustered around the high values. We don't have a lot of values down around 10%, but we have a lot of values around 80 to 90%. And maybe here is a situation where we think p is small. So, you know, cl lots of clusters around small values of p. So that, that's the idea, is we adjust these alpha and beta parameters um, of the beta distribution to try and, like, decide on a p that seems reasonable to us. 
these next two sliders, so, so sorry, this next graph gives us the posterior distribution of P. So here, we have the prior distribution, the simple beta. Here we have the posterior distribution conditioned on observing some specific uh, trials and successes. And recall that the interesting thing about the beta binomial conjugacy is if we start with a beta prior on P, right, a beta prior on P, where P is the parameter of a binomial, the posterior distribution of P over here, posterior distribution of P given X, right, where X is number of successes, the posterior distribution is also beta. So we start with beta as a prior, we get the posterior is, is also beta. And you can see the parameters here, um, the parameters are 25, right, we have 25, the first parameter is 25 successes plus alpha, plus one. So we have 25 plus one, and that's just a result you can recall from uh, the conjugacy. The, the posterior parameters are alpha plus the number of successes, and then beta, so one, plus the number of failures, where here we have 50 trials and 25 successes, so um, we, have, we have 25 failures as well. So, that, so that's our, that's kind of our, the idea of this, this posterior. And now this is saying, so here we had this prior guess, right, or prior guess was uniform, we weren't sure about P, then we observed, we observed 50 trials, 25 successes, so now our guess for P, given, given this data X, our posterior distribution, begins to clump up around 0.5. And that makes sense, right? Like we observed, we weren't sure at the beginning, we had this prior, we didn't know anything. We observed these kind of values, right? And now we start to see this becomes our guess. We can, now, as, now that we kind of understand what's going on, we can start to actually play with these parameters. So let's, let's consider like increasing the number of trials to 100 and putting the number of successes to 50. So notice that we still have this not, this uninformative prior, it's just uniform. But when we increase the number of trials, right? If you notice the variance got smaller. So we go, let's go back to 50 to check it out. So uh, let's have 50 in our heads. You see kind of has this like wide uh, variance and let's go quick to 100. And notice how uh, the variance actually shrinks. So the, the distribution gets tighter. This makes sense. We're more certain, if we view 100 trials, we're more certain um, that P is around 50% just because we have a larger sample size. If we go all the way down to P equals 10, you know, we have 10 and then five successes, then all of a sudden we have this, this large variance, right? Because now we just don't have a lot of samples, we're not as confident. We're still more confident here than we are in the prior, like the prior we have no idea, um, but uh, we're less confident if we have a large sample. So let's move uh, number of successes, number of trials back up to 50, number of successes 25, and now let's think about changing alpha and beta, so changing our prior guess on P. If we increase alpha, we saw that our prior will be right skewed. What does that mean for our posterior? Well, since we previously guessed that alpha will be right skewed, sorry, left, ske left skewed, um, if something has a slope that's going to the left, that means it's left skewed. Uh, that's, uh, I misspoke there. So something's left skewed, that means there's a lot of data clumped up on the right. Our posterior guess, our posterior distribution should also be clumped up on the right. And we see if we increase alpha, right, our prior distribution's increased. Our posterior distribution is also increased. So this is above 0.5. So we observed an empirical mean of one half, but since our prior guess that P was high, we have something slightly uh, bigger than 0.5. And the more extreme we drag alpha, so here we're saying our guess, our guess for P is very high. We think P is going to be very high on average. Um, sorry, we think P is going to be very high, so we have this random variable where it's very clustered around the right side. Um, then you see this posterior distribution even moves further to the right. And now that we kind of have these two effects, we can we can think of, so now we have the effect of the data that we observe and the prior effect. And now what I think is interesting is seeing how they kind of, seeing which one is stronger. Okay, so let's say, let's say here, let's say beta. Beta, go, the beta parameter goes to 10, the alpha parameter goes to uh, 1. In this setup, this is the most pessimistic prior I can have for P, where pessimistic, uh, when, I, when I say pessimistic, I mean like smallest, you know, distribution. Like, this distribution is really clustered around the left. It's, you know, there's not a lot up here. We're really, we're almost certain that P is small. So let's say we have this prior, and then we have this prior, but we observe a ton of successes. So despite thinking that P will be small, we actually observe a lot of successes. Let's see which one is stronger. Will the posterior distribution, you know, be centered, you know, be, be very small for P, or will it be high? So let's see. Let's drag, let's say we have 100 trials, and let's say we actually have, like, 90 five successes. So, you know, we predicted that P would be around here, but we actually observed 95 successes. And you can see that N, the, this, this data is actually stronger, right? So the prior is saying that P should be small, the data is saying that P should be large, and the posterior listens, quote unquote, listens to the, post, to the, to the data more, right? It's like this, this is stronger than, uh, than the prior. 
it would be less strong if I had a smaller sample size again. So if I have like, you know, if I move n to 30 and I say, okay, let's go success is all the way up to 26. It's it's not as far to the right as we were before, right? It's But it's but it's still stronger. It's still stronger than the prior. We still have a, a guess repeat that's above one half, whereas our prior is well below one half. And as, you know, as we continue to decrease the number of trials, like here, let's say we have five trials and five successes. Now it's not strong enough. Now, even though we observed 100% of the time we observed a success, um, this prior still pulls p to the left of one half, whereas you know even though we observed 100%. So it's so it's this really interesting trade-off. But as soon as you start to get like 20 trial, or you know, as soon as you start to get a good sample size and you start to sort of see um, some extreme data, that's when it sort of drags it up. But you can you can just think about and imagine playing with yourself the uh, the different forces at work. You can see which ones are stronger and when. And if you want to sample with uh, you know, with these parameters over and over, you can just continue to hit go. So here's go, you know, it's drawing different samples. These are, this is a random draw from the posterior distribution, random draw from the prior distribution. Um, so you can, you can do that to check.